Okay, so in the spirit of us talking about Elizabeth Holmes and Theranos, um, I want to, uh, for business strategies now, uh, I want to talk about how we could have done her project better. But first, we need to discuss more about what she did. So I want to jump into the Profiles and Success section first, so we'll do that now. Welcome, this is Profiles and Success, and today we're talking about Elizabeth Holmes. And her story is amazing because she got started when she was so young. Uh, in 2004, she had $6 million of venture capital funding. And at this point, she was still very young, like 19. And by 2010, so six years later, she had $92 million of funding. She's 25 years old at this point. In 2014, she had $400 million of venture funding and a $9 billion valuation. So this would have been on the back of a lot of lies. She would have been about 29 years old. I can't imagine having that responsibility at that age, but she did. And she just kept on upping the ante. For those of you that don't know, Elizabeth Holmes started Theranos. Theranos was an organization that promised to be able to take a tiny little bit of blood in a device that they had created or supposedly created, and it was supposed to give you results on all different types of blood tests at one time with a very small amount of blood. Like somehow the technology had advanced under everybody's nose to the point where just a few drops could tell you anything. Well, it turns out that this is not really possible. And the real interest in her story was the initial steps that she took. And I think these are steps that anybody can take. There's some really profound lessons in studying a crime. You can really learn how things really actually work. Or the crime would have never worked in the first place. So she was at Stanford, and her boyfriend was this man named Mr. Balwani, and he was, had been a student at Berkeley. She had been a high school uh, senior when she had met him when he was at Berkeley, and they had begun some sort of relationship. It's unclear how deep things had gone. Uh, but then she went to Stanford, and she started to have this idea. She started to shop an idea around to her professors. And there's such an interesting principle for business founders in this action. Before she started looking for money, before she started looking even for partners, well, she already had Mr. Balwani, but I, that doesn't really count in terms of uh, what I'm trying to say. She wasn't looking for help from the traditional startup community. She started looking at academics. It's a fascinating idea because academics oftentimes have connections to the business world. The business world is always curious what academics think about ideas. She went to all of her science professors, you know, biology, chemistry, and they said to her, no, there's no way that this is going to work. You're barking up the wrong tree. Uh, try something else. But she went to her other professors. She went to her engineering or unengineering professor named Channing Robertson. Channing Robertson was in the School of Engineering at Stanford, so he's already a very successful person. And he was actually the first board member on Theranos. So he championed her idea. She went to him. She said, I have an idea. And of course, the engineering department is not going to look at the medical truths of this in the same way that they're going to look at the engineering truths. You, we, we realized from the story of the engineers who want to work on the N95 mask, also Stanford engineers, by the way, um, engineers don't see the truth in the same way that medical people will see the truth. They will see what could be. Well, this device might be able to do this. They're not thinking medically, is it possible to do this? They only think about the capabilities of the, de of the device because their field is going to be their first uh, filter of, of, uh, of judgment. So engineering was much more hot about the idea than medical. That's what we need to move forward on. So they launched it. This Channing Robertson was able to introduce the, uh, Elizabeth Holmes to all sorts of venture capital people. Because this is Stanford, Stanford is close to Silicon Valley, and an engineering elite leader is going to be a voice that is going to be very closely listened to by the people who are trying to make money off the same field. So, in 2003, he joined the board. By 2004, they had $6 million in funding. The point I want to point out is because in the medical field, progress happens slow. From the moment that she got that $6 million of funding, she was able to take a paycheck. For the next 10 years, she was able to take a paycheck 
from her venture that she was part of, that she was leading, that she was, you know, fraudulently uh, representing. She was able to take 10 years of paycheck, 10 years of income, based on a product that could never work. She was able to raise more money. Now, obviously, she was lying along the way. But there's still a lesson here for people who just want to do a legitimate thing. You're going to be able to live off the development of this project for a long time. And she could have too. The real thing that uh, was very strange to me was in 2014, even though they knew that this wasn't working, they had to know by now we're not going to be able to make this work. They've been working on it for 10 years. In 2014... This is where the rubber really met the road, where it was like, okay, now we're really committing to a crime. We're really committing to a crime. Because they made an agreement with Walmart, uh, not Walmart, uh, Walgreens, the pharmacy chain, to administer their tests in the chain. So people are coming in from real life. Citizens are coming into Walgreens all over the country, having their blood tested. Wow, that was easy. Now I go home. Hey, you don't have any problems. Well, maybe they do. Hey, you do have problems. Well, maybe they don't. There was all sorts of false results one way or another. And it was almost like they were just choosing at random what to say in these tests. Well, these are life or death results. And sometimes they would take the test and put it through a proper machine just for people who were scrutinizing the business. Maybe uh, a bunch of executives from an investment firm come to the company. Hey, sit right here. We'll take your blood. Oh, we got to go over here into the secret room for a minute. We'll be right back. You know, it's not 100% transparent. This is the magic trick. Hey, why don't you guys come over here? Why don't you look at our uh, uh, a lounge? Let's have some coffee. Oh, our, your tests are ready huh? from our, our machine. Well, what they didn't know is that there's actually a proper machine, old school machine, in the back room where they can test properly. And so they, they got proper results. So, I mean, there's a lesson there in how to lie to people. There's a lesson here in how to, uh, you know, con your way to 10 years of income. And respect. I mean, this woman was a celebrity. By the time the House of Cards came crashing down, the investors who were meeting with her about her project were starstruck. She had become a bigger name than any of them. She was on TV. She was the darling of the liberal media. She was everything that uh, social justice warriors were hoping to find. A young, ambitious woman who had changed everything. Now, it cast a shadow over all the other young, ambitious entrepreneurs who actually deserved that recognition. Man and woman, and from many countries. Uh, it, it, uh, so sometimes when you get what you want, you actually, you know overshadow a lot of people who deserve it more. Uh, and they even made agreements with Blue Cross and AmeriHealth. I mean, these are major players in the medical industry. I can't believe they were willing to take it that far. At any point between 2004 and 2014, they could have said, you know what? It's not going to work. Uh, our tests are becoming more sporadic, slowly step away from the promises they've made, and you don't go to prison. Maybe you start a new venture. It's, there, there's, there's no shame in failing, necessarily. The shame is in the lies. The shame is getting caught in the lies. She will never get funding for another project again. And just another note. Uh, recently, she married the, I don't know how rich they are, but I think their, their trust fund level heirs to a small hotel fortune. His name is Bobby Evans. And uh, the whole world is shocked that she was able to pull off such a you know, with her reputation that anybody who's wealthy would welcome them into her life. But uh, from what I understand, this man is a very similar personality, so maybe it's uh, written in the stars. Finally, though, uh, John Carreyrou uh, Carrey uh, reported, and he followed her, and he caught her, and he tore down the entire facade that her and Balwani had been creating. Now she's about to go on trial later on this year, assuming coronavirus doesn't delay it, which it might. But she's looking at probably uh, some years in prison. Probably she could get up to 20, and I don't see why she would receive an entry level because I mean, this is a nationwide scandal. 
So anyways, that's profiles in infamy, I would say. And the reason you want to discuss it is because there's tremendous lessons in how to initially get started. You have your idea. You have your business plan. You've done some development on it. But even before that, or even in the same time, just go find an academic. They are purely minded in terms of the industry. They're going to look at your idea and say, wow, my industry. They're not necessarily going to say money first. They might But you're dealing with uh, a purity of purpose when you're dealing with the academic community, uh, usually. I mean, they want glory, they want recognition, but they want to contribute. So, uh, and they can they can introduce you to other faculty. They're the most approachable. It's much easier to approach a university professor with your idea than a venture capital boss. One of them is going to be. Uh, warm and interested on a, on a personal level and uh, you know, might you know, be willing to take you under their wing. Venture capital firms will only take you under their wing if you're going to help them grow too. So they wouldn't want to be your first contact. But so many just approach venture capital firms directly. The lesson in this is manageable step by manageable step. So just put in one extra person in there and they can carry you much further. That is... So, uh, okay, so now we're going to do strategy now, now that we've done it a little bit out of order. So we'll be right back.